I have to speak. The whole of Spanish I know, I learned from my roommate in college. And if I say those words, it's a colloquial ends, because they're not polite words. And we have a lot, so I'll, I'll give my talk in English, but I hope I give it slow enough and the slides are clear enough that everyone follows. And the other, it's a pleasure to be here. I've been to a math conference in Cuernavaca where I first met Anna, but I believe this was 19, or 2003. And then sometime later, maybe 2010, Anna and Pierre came to Chicago and Anna to the University of Illinois, where we began collaborating. Very innocent collaboration, because one of the students of Christina Cooperberg suggested a problem to us, just to work on. So we started working in 2010, and we worked, and Anna went to Northwestern, and Anna went to France, and Anna's here now. And finally, you know this is an American talk, so there will be product placement. You know what that is in the movies? Where you see a Coca-Cola can, or you see the book of the speaker? <laughs> finally, after six years, our book has been published, but it's not available on Amazon. It's only available, it looks like, in France right now. But we worked a long time on a problem that we didn't even know how difficult it would be when we started. So it's a pleasure to finish something like that, except that now we have more problems that we work on from them. The joke is that this book is K1, K2 has been submitted, K3, these are the names we give our papers, K3 is under development, K4 is being planned. So I told her her, her daughter, can work on K20. It's a lot, it's a big program, and so in what we're talking about is the dynamics of flows of a very special type. So, let's see this. This way? There. So flows are easy to define on the plane. This is calculus one or two or some level of calculus. You write a vector field in the plane. Then if you're a punish, you like punishment, you tell the students to draw the flow lines. Because you can't do that, the computer does it. But what I want to point out is look at those circles and look at these lines that go across the board. And then for extra credit, what is this the flow lines for? It's some kind of pendulum, yeah. It's every picture I have today is either ours or taken from the Wikipedia. So if you want the pictures, you can find them. But the point of this is that you've got different orbit behavior. And so you can always, if it's C1, define the local orbit. So a local orbit just goes a little bit like I stopped here. But some orbits go forever. And so you could ask what happens to the global orbits. And again, these go in circles, but these here, if it's really a pendulum, they probably close up. If it's really a mechanical system, a Hamiltonian system, you expect it to have trapped orbits. But in general, you don't know that unless you assume you're working on a torus or something compact, but for two dimensions, an orientable vector field means that the, you're dealing with an orientable two-manifold so torus. But here you can see what closes up is this circles the limit. Or in the second example, the lines aren't, there's no arrows, but they close up to the whole space. And if you know dynamical systems, you'll say, but they don't have to fill it up because it could be a Danjois flow. But there's a general theorem for two dimensions, Frank Ray Bendixson theory, that says that the flows are either limiting to circles or limiting to the whole space 
or if it's not C2, it could limit to a, a Donjois minimal set. But I don't want to go into that right now. Um, and then just a remark about the Poincaré-Hopf theorem. Two dimensions is very special. If there's a singularity, it gets very complicated, but it's still been studied completely. I don't know what open questions are. So that's the introduction. Flows in two dimensions make you think life is simple. Flows in three dimensions start the same. You have a vector field. You flow it for a little bit. And then you get lost. You simply, the geometric intuition, but mathematically the orbits are no longer trapped. And so when you go to say, I mean, I may be older than everyone here. I was talking about how I got a free ride on the metro yesterday. And so it was the gray, I'm sure. But it also is because I remember the 1970s when I was a graduate student. And if you used a computer, you punch carded it. You ran an IBM 360 or 370 at night. It cost $10 to run a simple job. So if you wanted to know the solutions of a three-dimensional vector field, you had to own the computer. And that meant you worked for IBM or Sperry or one of the giant machine, uh, business machine businesses. So these guys got free time, or for the federal government, and everyone knows the Lorentz attractor, right? It's simple. Oh, where is it? It's simple. I copied this off Wikipedia. Don't worry. It's, you can Google Lorentz and get it. But what's amazing is linear, uh, linear with a little quadratic twist, quadratic and linear with four constants, or three constants. And you have no idea what it looks like. At least I wouldn't. And I don't think anyone did, because what I've read about it said, they just punched in values, ran the program. And eventually you got this, which is nice. There's tons of these pictures on the web. You can animate them. You can flow them around. But what's so amazing is that if you try to compare this to the last picture of going around the torus, where you limit to a circle, this one, you go around and around and around, or maybe you go around and then hop over. There's a sort of a ping pong with side game being played between the two wings of this butterfly. So that's called chaos. It's, as far as I know, I'm not an expert in this sort of Stuff, but you really can't prove anything. You can just do a computer model. Um, but this has a certain chaos. I'll come back to that in a second. I just wanted to show another set of equations because I thought these are more symmetric in x, y, and z. Got more constants. And you don't know which values are going to be best, so you plug them in and look at the pictures. This is one way to do mathematics, I guess. Um, and it's sort of the way we started our work. That's why I wanted to show this, because the way we started analyzing the problem we were given was by trial and error. And anyway, this is actually not as nice as that, which there's a whole series of pages on this by different artists drawing it. Now, I don't, this isn't mathematics, I guess, except that a lot of mathematics pages have pictures like this on it. But it shows you that there's such a symmetry and complexity that it makes it interesting to the eye. Makes it some type of art. But if you want to analyze something like this, or like this, the way you do it in business is you can't just draw pictures forever, is you have to somehow reduce the problem. You take, choose a reduction of the problem from 3 to 2. So a reduction to 2, it's a classic Frank Ray section. He studied it for, I guess, flows in the, you know, he was studying the 
evolution of the solar system, so flows in three dimensions. You look at a cross section, you look at the return, and I'm just giving it a notation. I'll, we'll see another example in a minute, but you look at how points come back to a surface, and when you choose the section, maybe you'll choose a good one and see something interesting. So what we're interested in is points that don't leave, that keep coming back. That's the dynamical property. So these points, you can isolate the non-wandering ones. They really come back over and over. Or you could isolate, do I have minimal? There's another more restrictive notion of minimal that I'll put up in a minute. But the basic problem that you're asking is how do you describe the return set, the omega set? Uh, you might as well, it's one of those dreams. How can you say what that looks like? So the history of the Lorenz attractor is that the Henon system was built to approximate the section, and you get this famous picture for the Henon attractor. Now, again, I think the, I don't, when I copy the picture, I don't give credit, but everybody did this model. And there's all kinds of Java applets, or just all sorts of applets on the web where you can build your own pictures. But this is like 10,000 data points. And it's only the forward direction. But if you look at this and say, what is this thing doing? What's the dynamics of this picture? It helps to compare it with an old idea of smell, which is that there's a thing called a horseshoe. And the horseshoe, well, this is a, what is that, something to cover uh, What? Yeah. And you do it once, and you do it twice, and you do it eight times, well, to, you know, the number of times you get to the end, or you do it the other direction and you get it up. And compare that, where was the last one? Compare that to that. What's missing is, for simplicity, I don't show you the backward direction. But you can see here, that has possibilities. So one way to do dynamics is choose a section and look for horseshoes. And that's, I should say, one way that may be the only way that commonly works. Somehow the idea of a horseshoe is so powerful, but it's, a it's almost characteristic of a system being hyper uh, expansive or chaotic. Because the other kind of system, you have to go back all the way to the torus, where it just, does, it just wraps in on a circle. That's something really simple. These things are called more snail because their dynamics, well, if you slice it, you see more snail. So you get these two kinds of dynamics, and you can say, well, horseshoes or just asymptotic to one circle or something like that. So that's my summary of three-dimensional stuff, except what is uh, the motivation for a lot of work is that you really don't solve the equations, but the question became, well, there's just too much. It's like the business with the, uh, I should go back for a second, the business with these, where you have a choice of parameters A and B, or here you have a choice of parameters A, alpha, beta, delta, rho. If you have one parameter that works and does something interesting, what about the nearby parameters? These are the stability questions. And so I think it's fair to say that the organizing principle for three-dimensional dynamics has been, is there a typical behavior that everything can be approximated by? And this, again, there's the uh, palace conjecture says that it's either simple of more smell type or simple with horseshoes. So then I found this quote irresistible from the web. Or maybe it was a math review, but no, it had to be from a wiki. 
because the English is not approximately right. But the sentiment is. This is a very deep, hard problem. It is dream of every mathematician, dynamical mathematician. But the idea is to classify something by knowing, well, I don't know exactly, but I know what it is close by. So that's this conjecture. And uh, for two-dimensional, the conjecture can be asked in any dimension. But for two dimensions, this is a famous paper, Pujols and San Marino. And I don't know the status of this archive paper. But it claims it for flows in three spaces. Or maybe for all flows. And maybe uh, Rodriguez Hertz has some version of it for three space. Anyway, this is the uh, shows that when you go to study three dimensional flows, they're very, very hard. Now, this has, what does this have to do with the project that Anna and I worked on? The problem we worked on was complete opposite of this. What we were studying is flows without a periodic orbit. Now, all of the, the any time you have a horseshoe, there's lots of periodic orbits. The horseshoe has these trapped regions, and there's, in fact, the, the periodic orbits grow exponentially in number. And similarly, the ones that are more smale, the dynamics are very simple. So the question, an old question, was the three spheres, the test case, but you can ask it not for any three manifold, but three is good, S3 is the one they asked for. Does the hot vibration, which is all circles, have a perturbation without a periodic orbit? Does the flow in circles? And the answer, I believe, in that case is you could, um, prove that anything that's very close to the hot vibration also has a fixed point. But that's not the question. The question is, is there some vector field on the three screw? So my introduction to this problem, and I actually never cared much about it, I'm sorry. My introduction was um, when I met Paul Schweitzer, who is, I hope everybody knows Paul, he's this wonderful guy, mathematician from Princeton, got his degree under uh, Eilenberg, or one of the topologists at Princeton, and then went and became a, a Jesuit priest, and has been a leader of the uh, order in Rio since the 70s, maybe late 60s. And anyway, he proved that this conjecture False. He came up with a way to make C1 flows that have no periodic orbits. And his proof uses the Donjois example that I mentioned at the beginning and didn't show you the picture. The next time I ran into this problem was when I was at Princeton and they were trying to get this paper refereed. This is a famous paper by Jenny Harrison that instead of using Paul's standard embedding of a um, Dajois minimal set, she came up with a very crinkly method that gave C2 flows. Very hard to follow. The next time I ran into this was in Tokyo in 1993, published in the Annals in 94, but in November 93, there was a group of us at a meeting in Foliations, and what the group was, Gies, Schweitzer, Shigenori Matsumoto, my, you know, a group of us, and this paper had arrived, and there was an instant seminar in which Christina Cooperberg showed that you can always find C infinity flows. So this is like 10 pages. This is like unreadable. This is Paul's arguments were, 
So it, the complexity of the, this approach made you think it's an impossible problem. But in, turn, in fact, so when Anna came to Chicago for her postdoc, from her degree, got her degree in Lyon with APNGs, well, this is something she knew, and she started to explain it to me again. So we worked on that for, and I would like to use that as a transition, a segue, but the paper of Cooperberg, 10 pages, mine, references, 8 pages. Paper in Bourbaki by Gis, yeah, you got a lot of references, 20, 22 pages. How long is the paper of myself and Anna? 250. Why? Well, it turns out that after the, this paper a long time ago, see these are flows that don't fit in the usual category. They solved a famous problem, but the flows in three dimensions, you usually don't have tools. How do you study them? Horseshoes, uh, Morse male assumes you have some potential function, or maybe some Hamiltonian, which I didn't talk about here. Um, but what we did is we just decided that this was like a car left in one of the, re one of the districts of you know, Mexico City where you shouldn't leave your car. I was told that Ninos, is that a bad area? Nino, what? What? Yeah, Nino's arrows. There's some area where they say, leave your car and come back and it'll be uh, remodeled, reshaped. Well, they left this paper sitting in the web on print for 20 years. So, my compliment, I would like to point out that we stripped it. And we rebuilt it. So the point of it is, that these are extremely interesting flows. And what I'd like to do for the second part of the presentation is talk about why you want to study a problem that's been solved. So the first thing is that the solution of the problem, it was observed that these flows have some very interesting properties. One was just a, a Gis remark that well, Katak has a famous paper, Anatoly Katak, in which he showed that if you have a flow with positive entropy on a three manifold, it has to be C infinity or at least C3, uh, then there's lots of periodic orbits. The periodic orbits calculate the entropy. So if there's no periodic orbits, the entropy is zero. Well, that means they're not chaotic in some sense. So these flows of Cooperberg are somehow not crazy, well, chaotic. Um, then there's a second thing that was observed by both Etienne and uh, Shigenori Matsumoto, is that these flows have a unique asymptotic minimal set. All the orbits head to some set. Well, that's very... That's like the case of the torus, where there was one orbit, a circle. So somehow everything goes to this one set. What is that set? That's the question that Christina had asked and uh, Alex Clark, her student, had posed to us. Can we define, describe the shape of that set? And well, what we did is a lot more. We completely tell you everything you want to know about the set, its shape, its properties, and this is absolutely fascinating what turned out to be true. For example, we first discovered that in the works that were published, they just said take any flow. Well, I'm going to show you some pictures in a few minutes and explain what's wrong, but they said take any flow. Well, the first thing we discovered is you shouldn't take any flow. Because the, the aperiodic part is always true. But anything else you want to know about geometry, you, every time you do geometry, you'd like to see the word generic. It just means get rid of the pathological stuff. So I'll explain in a minute what that's about.
But then the non-wandering set, we actually show is the minimal set, and we show that this thing looks like a lamination with boundary. Now, laminations are surfaces. Lamination with boundary are surfaces with an edge. The problem with these laminations with boundary is that the boundary is dense in the whole space. That's not good. A one-dimensional line dense in the two-dimensional space is always problematic. It's, it's, and I'm not going to go there because I think Anna said she's talked about this, or you can buy the book. It's full of pictures. It shows you what these look like. But then we analyzed what happens on this flow. And yes, the entropy is zero, but not the slow entropy. So maybe you have to go searching to find slow entropy, but it was introduced by Katak a long time ago, and it's a notion of not exponential chaos, but in this case, square root of n exponential, e to the square root of n exponential. So it means something's happening, but you just don't, uh, it's, it's, it's something special in my opinion. This, we saw this, it's in the written up, and we said, what's going on with that? So these flows are tame, they're special, and they almost have positive chaotic entropy. So that's the setup for what we showed. What we asked was, okay, now that we completely understand what Christina did in her paper, and way more than anyone wanted, but you need the basis, everything checked. So then we said, well, these are special flows with very somewhere in between properties of the first slides. Are they more smell, or are they, do they have horseshoes? So the result that we obtained, and it's our latest, this is what we call K2, K3 will be forthcoming in a few months, and then we'll see K4. But these flows have a lot of interesting properties. One of them, and I, I'm jumping ahead, so I'm just going to let you read it, is that on one side, these flows are more smell, or they're very simple. On the other side, they're chaotic with horseshoes. Well, this is somewhat special because this, this, this path between these two types of behavior is a smooth deformation through flows on a three-manifold. And that smooth deformation, it's not C, just C1. All the previous work has been about C1 close. These are smooth variationals. And the other thing is that, not unlike the Lorentz, where you randomly pick values, we can tell you what values give you chaos and give you simple. So I think they're fascinating. And that's the second part of the talk I wanted to explain. How do you get something like this after you've done the earlier work? So the conclusion is that these flows of a special generic lie in between these two notions. And there's a lot we still don't understand about these things. So let me show you how we get them. Now, a plug. I need to show you the picture. That's a plug. That's a boring plug. It does nothing. Flow, the lines come in, the lines go out. So look at the definition. The lines come in, the lines come out. Anything not trapped goes out the opposite face. It sits inside of three space, nice vertical. So this has all those properties. There's one thing it's missing, and that is a plug should not be useless. This plug, a plug should have at least a trapped point. So the original Wilson plug who invented this idea or introduced it, um, it sucked up. It was like a vacuum that sucked up. It was an attractor 
axiom eight type attractor, and it would take whole open sets of orbits and trap them to periodic orbits. This is the useless plug. This is the fancy plug. So this is, there's two or three key ideas that were introduced by Christina Cooperberg. And I'm, Christina is a big fan of Anna and myself because we travel around the world shouting out her name. So if that doesn't, unfortunately, I don't think she's on the NSF grant panels anymore. So anyway, it's beautiful ideas here. The first thing she did is take this traditional Wilson plug, which this isn't. And this plug, I've simplified just showing you the final result. Things come up, they spin, they get halfway, and then they turn around and go backwards. So this means that if I'm, those orbits are actually quite useless. They spin, then come out the other side, reversing their direction. So it's a plug. The only exception is that there's two periodic orbits here and here, O1 and O2, and the orbits that come in on that spiral into them, just like in the torus in the first slides. There's a simple attractor here, and on the other side, they repel up to this, and then up. So this is a very simple dynamic on an embedded torus, and nearby orbits do what they have to do. And she explained this, she said, the first idea was that she realized she couldn't use the traditional Wilson plug. She had to have the thing flow like this. And then once you've got this, it's a plug, it, it would suffice to take an orbit and if it came up exactly at this cylinder, which is called R2, I don't know if it's marked, but the radius 2 cylinder, those orbits are trapped. But there's more periodic orbits, so you haven't done anything useful like get rid of them. So then there's a second idea, which is skipping all the text. It's this picture. This is this, I don't know if this is the sort of thing when you're dreaming, do you dream this? You know, it's mathematics, so maybe she did. She woke up and said, oh. Because what happens is, remember, those orbits are spinning, and what she's done is made the fold of her figure, her, her circle became a figure, double circle, and then they spin, but then they hit themselves. And I'll show you the next slide, but by doing this, they trap the orbits that you need to break in themselves. And if you look up close, that's one of these key insertions. These orbits are coming and spinning, and then they hit here. But when they hit here, this thing, that little notch, is actually some other place on this circle. So when they go in here, they keep going. They, they spin around. And so what you do is this simple geometric insertion process builds a recursive structure that the orbits have to satisfy. And this takes a lot, you know, it's, it takes a lot of care to make sure everything does what you want because there's a lot, it's just dynamics in three space. But the result, well, I want to show you one more thing, is that this picture shows you the cylinder twisted and inserted sideways as opposed to the cylinder going across. So I want to show you this face and just that face. Now, it barely looks like it, but the square, is this thing parameterized? And these are the inserted cylinders sideways. And this is the vertical cylinder. And so what the big technical idea of this construction, oops, too far, is that she took the magic trapped orbits at radius 2, twisted the thing, no problem. In your dreams, you just twist it and insert it. And then they make contact, just like that. 
And that's called the radius inequality. Now, if you have that, anytime you have that, the genius of the construction is that everything is aperiodic. There's no possibility of periodic orbits. So she's broken the orbits. And the process is smooth. You just inserted it. Or you can analytically insert it if you're more careful. You can actually see this picture. Now I can explain generic. This picture looks like a parabola and another parabola touching a line. You could actually, I don't know if you can, what happens if you did like pick any curve in calculus and do it. I don't, I don't know what happens to the dynamics. But it, you could, for example, instead of quadratic, you could make this infinitely smooth when it comes in. Well, we don't know the dynamics of these. Generic means that this is a quadratic contact point. And generic means that these other parabolas are also quadratic with respect to their vertical. So in other words, it turns out that when you go to analyze these things, this is a change of coordinates around what turns out to be the point where you're going to renormalize the whole system. The method of proof of all these things can be thought of as a type of quadratic renormalization. And this is the renormalization point. So you want it to be quadratic there. And that's the summary of what takes all the work. Because renormalization arguments are incredibly tedious. If it's not, we don't know the answers. But if you make it generic, it turns out that the theorems in the uh, beginning are all true about the minimal set, uh, about the slow entropy, and all that. <clears throat> I guess it's time to ask for questions. Does this, this is a summary of what you did. And if you just have that picture, it doesn't make, you don't see how you're supposed to build the dynamics of something like this. And I think one of the things we did in our work was explain for the dedicated reader, that's a code word for patient reader, how it all works. And not only that, then we go about using those things. So we have this very good understanding of this plug that was left in the roadside, mathematical roadside. We just, we can tell you everything you change here, what will happen when you do it. So here's something you can change. I always like, I don't know, I always like to think that when you do something like computers, everything you do is supposed to be, well, here it's supposed to be exactly radius inequality means two equals two. But with computers, that's never true. So you'd like to say, what happens if we only approximated it? What if we, so if Christina had told me to build this, and I was her student. Actually, we were both students together at Rice in the early 70s. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have made them touch. Maybe I would have, or maybe I would have said, let's just do something else. So you can do variations where instead of inserting it all the way, which is there so that they touch, perfect touching, you could not go far enough. <clears throat> or you could uh, go too far. Now, it's the sort of thing that it's af after you've been studying a problem, you think, whoa, 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 what's this? It turns out we can say something. Partly because if you've ever seen, if you had been in Strasbourg, you would have seen years of diagrams on their blackboard and the Northwest and everywhere we go, it was blackboard picture after blackboard picture. And what for? Because if you see this, oh, what's this? Hold it. This is where Anna tried to cheat. This is a picture of this evolution. So how do you study the Lorentz model? You run a computer model. It turns out that this is an attempt at a computer model for the minimal set in this dynamic, but it's only like one iteration or two. 
You don't, you can't do it. It's too much data. So the method of understanding what does it mean to do something like this, well, we're going to actually go back to the standard approach in dynamics and take a section. So the problem with sections, there's technical issues, but when you resolve the technical issues, which I, that's what we got really good at, um, you get something, a pseudogroup. And from this picture here, up there, if you follow how the dynamics works, oops, there's the cross section, just to record it. It doesn't help a lot, but we choose a cross section and look at how the orbits hit the cross section. If you do that, you can isolate key maps and you get a picture that looks like this. This we've had for a few years. And what this is, is you can see this tangency, which is the insertion. And then this process here, which flips it, is the insertion of the Cooperberg insertion process by a handle. And then this is Wilson flowing you up. But every time you flow up, you keep reinserting. And so this is a picture we've had that said, oh, this is a ping pong game. You know, ping pong game with dynamical systems is where you have alternating targets, like here or here or here or here. And so you count the number of targets and it grows exponentially, except this map psi is, is tricky in that to go from here to here and here to here takes longer and longer and longer. And it grows, in fact, like the square of time. So actually this is positive entropy for the square, which is known as slow entropy. So anyway, we have this famous picture, famous for us, and then when you push the thing in further, it gets like that. Which again doesn't maybe look too exciting, but all of a sudden they go up faster, they go over too far, and the picture is not quite precise because what you need to do is ask yourself, what happens to these curves when my computer picture is failing and they're very close here? And that's where, when Anna started drawing those pictures, she got something like this. Now, if you can sort of see the same thing, here's this, here's this, but the first thing is that my, my, my curves don't have hooks, but in reality there's a hook, it comes up, there's a, a, actually the two point, but look what this is looking like. I liked it. You can go all the way back to the beginning, oops, wrong way, I wish these things had an automatic pop-up. Let's go back. Or that, but this is better. Once you see a turning with a self-insertion, you are then, what happened? You are then looking at a horseshoe system. And so if you repeat it, it turns out, well, you can follow it, and the whole picture is replicating itself. So that the pictures that we were showing you, based on pictures, we're able to then prove the existence of horseshoes for these perturbations. And so that's sort of remarkable that you have a system which when you make a mistake and push it too far, it turns out that nearby, all of a sudden you get a recurrent thing that's a horseshoe. So that recurrent property uh, is for the pseudogroup which means that there were two maps generated and by a subsystem. And it turns out to be there's a technical problem that you have to make sure that this is really, instead of what you might call a virtual horseshoe that exists in some model of your system, you also have to prove that it's realized by the flow. And that's what we're able to do 
So we know that for certain classes now of constructions, the um, perturbations of a Cooperberg flow, a periodic flow, gives you a system with this horseshoe dynamic, positive entropy. And I didn't want, I didn't prepare it, but you actually, it's not just one horseshoe. It turns out that, I mean, everything about this system is complicated. It turns out that the minimal set that we calculate, one of the problems we solved. The last chapter in the book in the original problem was we showed that these minimal sets, these laminations, have what's called unstable shape. It means that when you take open neighborhoods of them and let the open neighborhood system collapse, it's an idea of Borsuk, who was Cooperberg's advisor, thesis advisor. So it's natural, what is the shape theory of these minimal sets? Well, it turns out that the shape of these minimal sets is wildly complicated too. It's unstable, it has other characteristic properties, but when you look at a description, for every shape approximation, essentially every one, you get a horseshoe. So this is some sort of very, I would say evil, form of Conley index theory. That in this sort of shape approximations, you get not fixed points, but horseshoes popping up out of the shape approximations. So it's really, really an interesting sort of dynamical system to study. And that's why the conclusion is that we don't know very much, but every time we open up one part of this type of dynamics, it's not more snail. It's not actually A or the other types of hyperbolic. It's some area that's in between and mostly undeveloped and very interesting. Thank you.